What's up guys, my name is Colin Smith and today we're going to do some live programming on a data set that I haven't seen. I've been wanting to do this for a while and thought it would be a good idea to make a beginner tutorial to just highlight some of the key components of Python and the way that I particularly go about exploring data sets. And uh, a lot of people ask, you know, when they're working through, you know, these online courses to learn how to program on what they can do to improve their skills. And I always suggest that taking on a project and working from there and figuring out what you need to know uh, to be able to complete the project is a really good route to go. And uh, some people have a hard time doing this and just jumping right into something new. And so I thought it would be a good idea to just take a random data set uh, from somewhere that I have not seen before and just show my thought process as I would do some just basic analysis and highlight some key functions uh, that you should use and different ways to explore the data. Uh, so looking for just a random data set, I came across this Keel database. And so it has some standard classification data sets to use. So our goal today is going to be to pick choose one of these data sets randomly, uh, which I've selected five uh, that have a sufficient number of data points as well as are all two class examples. And I've only read the headers of these. So on, on this data source, they have all these different data sets with the number of examples, the classes, and then they have a header that kind of explains um, what they are and what the goal is. So it gives you a little insight into what the features look like and what the goal to predict is. And so I thought I would choose five that seemed to be um, manageable. And from there, we're going to just take it and do some exploratory data analysis and then try to build up to a model. And so we're going to cover things like uh, feature importance, cross-validation, uh, hyperparameter tuning, and really just all the steps that you would take in working with a real data set. And uh, I thought it'd be even better with doing it live in a situation where I do will, will have to go download other packages or explore uh, different ways of doing things online. So we have five data sets that I have not unzipped yet. Don't know the file formats, what we're going to have to go through here. Um, so these are all from that site that I mentioned. And we are going to generate a random number to choose which one we will do the analysis on. And also, to give you a little background on me, I am currently a master's student at Columbia in Applied Mathematics, and have spent this last summer at a commodities hedge fund uh, doing uh, machine learning work in regards to financial time series. So the bulk of my knowledge and understanding is in uh, time series machine learning, but I uh, feel like I have a, a fairly good grasp on just standard uh, machine learning as well. And so I hope to just mainly highlight this, uh, these tools and ideas to maybe a beginner intermediate level audience, people that are you know, just finishing taking maybe an online course or something like that and are looking to dive in and do something on their own. Uh, I think this should be a, a good, good starting point as well as maybe be something that is enjoyable to, to watch. All right, so we got five here. So we'll just generate a number between one and five and the, we'll just make the top one, one, two, three, four, five, and see which one we're gonna analyze here. So once again, I have not looked at any of these data sets uh, at all. Number two, we are going to analyze the diabetes data set. So let's go ahead and move this to a new folder to get ready here. Go ahead and unzip it. All right, it's a, a dot dat file. And let's go ahead to and look at the uh, the header for this file. Oops. So, and we are on the diabetes file. Can't search that.
Mm. Uh, I think this is the Pima file, actually. I think it's named something different. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the diabetes file. So we have uh, data from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. Um, it's chosen from a larger database. And the class label is two classes represents if the person has not has diabetes or the person has diabetes. And we're given some attributes of them. Number of times pregnant, plasma glucose concentration, dia, dia, diastolic blood pressure, uh, tricep skin fold thickness, two-hour serum insulin, body mass index, diabetes, pedigree function, age. And so we have 768 data points. There are no missing values, uh, which is nice. And um, these look like to be numerical values, um, all of them. OK, so that sounds good. So now we have the data here. Let's just open it in a text editor. I like to use VS Code for my text editor. Generally, uh, working with CSV data sets is the easiest uh, just because they load into Python well. In this case, it looks like if we, so this is our, looks like the features, the column names are listed at the top and then it just gives them in that order. Uh, so that should be fine, and we might have to, hmm, probably going to just save this as a CSV, and then uh, and take these out, and then just put them the column names back in. So let's do that, actually. So we're just going to create a copy of this, and just to make sure, we will... Hmm. Yeah, we can go ahead and let's see. Let's see, let's see. Okay. I think Excel will import these for us, but I guess one of them we're going to need to take off the top part. Alright, we're going to call this just Pima Data, and we're going to open up the workbook. We probably could just load this in and specify that the separator is a comma, uh, but this is also an option if we did want to just have the Excel sheet. I think this is, might be a good idea to do, just in general which I am not sure. I think I can just get it from a file here. Let's see. Let's see. If not, we'll just try to load it into Python with a the separator. All right, now we need to find that document. So that should be Diabetes, random data set files, let's just do all files. Hopefully let us do it, even though it's not a text file. I hope. Okay, so it looks like it uses the common delimiter fine and we can just load the data. And I just want to make sure that we are filming and recording right now before we get too far into this. Things look good. Cool. All right, so it got the data. We want to just make it so there's no formatting. Um, we might as well just throw this into another one. Generally, we can just copy and paste just the values. Um, yeah, we can just do the values. Cool. And then we will add back in those uh, 
the column names that we originally ignored to make sure those line up well. So we'll put that here and we need to reopen the original file. Cut. Don't need this anymore. All right, so uh, Prague, I assume, is the first column here. Prague class press skin into mass petty age. Cool. Uh, looks like it makes sense. Age variable should be there. Probably number of times pregnant. Wow, fourteen is quite a bit. <laughs> I guess there's a max of seventeen there. All right, so it looks like the column names get got on there fine. So now we have the CSV to work with. So we're gonna uh, make might as well make sure here. So we got 768 uh, entries, which should be sufficient for our purposes. So we're gonna save this in the folder we've been working on. All right, so we'll save this as uh, Pima, and then just save it as a CSV. Okay, great. Now we can actually get into Python. Oh, we forgot one thing. We forgot the, the label here. So we're going to call this uh, label. So we save that. It should be good. All right, so I prefer to use Spider um, when I'm working with data. In Python, I really like the variable explorer, which we'll see we can open up the different data frames or whatever you're working with and actually inspect it and to easily point, to figure out if there's any flaws or uh, if there's missing values. It just makes things a lot easier than running everything from a command line. Uh, but, but there are some downsides to Spider. And, uh, uh, but for our purposes, when you're just exploring data in general, it's nice to be able to just run quick pieces of code rather than having to run the entire of uh, the entire program. A Jupyter Notebook also does great things uh, on that front, as well as being able to run just sections of it, as well as produce the output in line, uh, which makes it really nice for when you want to present these results to other people or share it online. Uh, but for now, we're going to use this. So we're going to just import pandas spd. We're going to need that. Uh, we'll just probably import things as we go. Um, so first, we're just going to read in the data frame file. Uh, first, we want to make sure our working directory is set to the location of the CSV. And so we have that in here. And from here, we can just do pd.read CSV and specify the file path. And since we're already in the working directory of the random chosen, this should just be pima.csv. And it automatically defaults to a header true since those are all columns, so that shouldn't be an issue. And the separator is also as a default. Oh, we're going to need to run import pandas. So I like to just highlight and control enter to run these. That's what I have it set up as. And then if there's anything additional, I'll just type it in down here uh, when we get to it. Cool. So here's an example of what the variable explorer looks like. So we imported all of the data. Uh, the numerical values are color coded, which makes it really easy to spot any like differences. So for example, you can quickly see that that's a zero uh, while the other, just based on the color. And just taking a look at our data, no extras get inputted. Look, everything looks pretty good. Um, that's a little odd. 767. Oh, I must started at zero. Okay. Yep. So we have the amount of rows that we expected. And so now we can start taking a look at this. So our goal eventually is to use these features to try to predict uh, this label. Uh, but to get there, first we're just going to want to look at some general properties of the data set to get a sense of the distributions, um, if there's any, how many outliers exist in all of these. Uh, the correlations between these variables, and so on. And it, it's helpful in these cases, too, to have a little bit of intuition about the fundamental problem. So uh, I am no expert in these actual medical descriptions and, and issues, uh, but if you do have domain knowledge and expertise, you can get a little bit more creative with how you approach this and can understand how to combine different variables, which is really helpful uh, when you're trying to build a better classifier. And so first, we're just going to take a look at what we have. So I like to just do df.describe, which will give us a uh, breakdown of all the variables here. So sometimes it won't show 
all, all of the columns here. So you need to turn on uh, to show max columns. I believe it's just a command here. Yeah, so you can just go here. We'll just set it to 500. Uh, we can just put it down here. Yeah, save it. Uh, now, when we do it the second time, we should be able to see everything here. Oops. Awesome. So now we should be able to see the breakdowns for all of the columns. Perfect. Uh, so just taking a look at these, they all have the same counts, meaning there's no missing values there. Uh, then it shows the mean, standard deviation, the minimum, 25 percentile, 50 percentile, 75 percentile, and the maximum. So this is good to just get a quick sense of how the data is distributed. And so we can quickly see uh, the mean here is on the lower end, so this is not a normally distributed feature because uh, this is the number of times pregnant. Uh, so you'd expect the average, the mean to be closer to zero, and then with a large, uh, pot, large tail on the right. And so. Then next, we can go ahead and plot histograms of these. Uh, we can look at the correlations. Um, just taking a look at some more of these real quick. Let's see what we have here. And so here too, you can see in the 25 percentile is still zero, meaning there's going to be a lot of zeros there, uh, which we'll also be able to see in the histogram case. Okay. So now let's let's take a look at some of the histograms for these. So what we can do is import matplotlib. All right. Um, real quick too, I want to get a sense of what these features were again. I think it's often overlooked uh, how much value you can add just by having a better understanding of what the features are and then how those interact with the, uh, the output variable. So uh, even though I still won't be able to understand it in a medical sense, I think that it will be helpful to have a little bit more understanding of what exactly we're working with here. All right, so let's, let's think about this a little bit. So we are predicting diabetes, so number of times pregnant. I assume there's some medical reason why the number of times pregnant has an influence on diabetes. So we have plasma glucose concentration, okay. Uh, we have blood pressure, tricep skin fold thickness. That's an interesting one. Um, we have insulin. We have body mass index. Okay. And we have diabetes pedigree function. Not sure what that is. Maybe something with genetics. I don't know. And we have age. Okay, so we have basically some different physical measurements as well as body properties. And our goal then is to suggest whether or not the person has or does not have diabetes. And they're getting tested. Um, in this case. So they must um, have some reason for being tested in the first place. It looks like it's from a larger data set. Uh, but okay. So we are going to go ahead then and just continue looking at some histograms. This is generally a good starting point. Um, so that's just plt.hist. And then you just specify the column that you'd want. Um, so I mean, we might as well look at the preg one. So this is the number of times pregnant, which we saw is going to look um, heavily skewed. I apologize for, uh, sometimes it seems to be running a little bit slow. I think it's because I am recording this that it does that. And we're also going to just save this file so we don't lose it. Okay, so, yep, as expected, uh, this is what kind of it looks like for 
the number of times pregnant. Makes sense. Cool. Um, any other ones that we're particularly concerned with here? Hmm. I guess I'm curious what the skin one uh, would be. So let's take a look at that. Okay. Interesting. Um, not sure really how to interpret that, but that's good. And also a nice trick too, if you have something like that where it's kind of hard to see the detail, you can increase the number of bins. So if I want to do just 20 bins um, for the histogram, this gets a little bit more into, ah, so that, that definitely painted a better picture. So we have a lot of them with zero. That seems odd. Uh, I have a feeling that's probably a data quality issue. Uh, I imagine that this looks pretty normally distributed and I don't think it is natural to have maybe zero uh, skin thickness on your triceps. Uh, so that may be something we uh, consider when we're creating this model, that there are gonna be cases where you are given data that does have issues. Uh, so maybe for now, we're just gonna continue with this, but this may be something we wanna come back to and look for uh, other situations where there's outliers like this that may skew the distribution because this does look oddly suspicious. Uh, maybe it was that they didn't have the ability to test them at the time for this or they just filled in the missing values with zeros. Uh, but that does seem odd. Uh, that's a good find though. So the bins is nice to add there. And then most importantly, what we want to look at is the histogram of the output variable. Because if these aren't balanced, if there's not a good distribution between them, uh, we're going to have to adjust the way we go about creating a model. So <clears throat> we're going to take a look at df.label. Might be capital. I hope I closed the previous plot, or it's going to probably give us some trouble here. Probably did not close it. All right, let's try to force close that. Okay, let us restart the kernel here. I think it's really struggling since we're streaming, recording while uh, trying to run these. Alright, let's run this part again. This probably could become an issue later on when we're trying to train a model with how slow this is going. It's kind of unfortunate, but we're going to have to make do. Wow. Hopefully there's some other issue because this is not encouraging. Ah, it's because they are not integers. Forgot about that. So we want to probably change the label and make it so that zero maybe is not, it does not have diabetes and one does have diabetes. And the way we're gonna do that is just using a, a numpy command. So we have import numpy as np. And what we're gonna do is do reset label equals mp dot where and then you can put in a condition and uh, to output values so we're gonna say when uh, the df dot label equals we're gonna need to see what that is for the positive one so let's rerun that okay so it looks like it is tested positive and tested negative Okay, so we'll say tested positive is going to be a 1, else it's going to be a 0. We only have two classes, so that's all we need to concern with. 
All right, so now we can take a look in the data frame, make sure that that occurred. Looks good. Now let's try that one more time. This time works just fine. All right, so we have a slight imbalance here, uh, which we might want to take into account later on, and which will influence how we want to evaluate uh, the R model's performance. Uh, but for now, let's just continue a little bit more on the, the feature side. Um, so the next thing we can look at is the correlations. So correlations are important for one, uh, looking at possibly important features that are correlated to the label. And then secondly, the correlations between the features themselves can uh, it can have problems when constructing the model. Uh, features are too correlated, uh, it could get confused, and something that we just want to be aware of. So what we're going to do is just create a correlation matrix, and we're going to visualize it with Seaborn. Uh, I like to look at the Seaborn plot, it's really nice. So we can just import, I believe it's as that is an S. So then we just create the matrix equals, I believe, df.core, and then you can do, let's see, I think it's... Yeah, this is the one I like to do. Uh, so what you can do, we did that part, it just creates a mask that does half of it. You can basically just copy and paste this and put in the parameters that we're using. And so, this is just core matrix, core matrix, all right, um, let's see if that works, oh, we didn't run the DF core, select it all, didn't work, looks like SNS is not defined, we didn't run that. No module named Seaborn. I can't remember what it's called. Looks like I don't have Seaborn installed, so what we can do is we can do a pip install. Uh, oh, looks like I just spelled it wrong. So we did have it installed, we're all good to go. So now this should generate the heat map that we're looking for, perfect. Uh, so this can give us some insight into the correlations between these variables. Uh, so we got on each axis, we have the different variables and then the point at which they intersect is those correlations based on this correlation map here, ranging from negative one to positive one. Uh, so I guess to start, we wanna be looking at the label because these would be very helpful if they're highly correlated. We see that the plas and the mass have pretty strong correlations uh, particularly for a label um, and feature relationship here. Uh, that's important to note. Those are probably going to be powerful variables that we may see uh, later on. And so we might just take some notes too while we're at it. Okay, so a couple of notes that we've came across so far are uh, the the skin possible data quality issue. That's something we want to consider. Uh, we have uh, unbalanced class labels, which we'll want to take into account when we start building a model. And uh, in this case, we see we have plas and mass have high correlation to label. Okay. And outside of that, we see a couple of other high correlations. We have skin and mass. Interesting. Um, I guess maybe there's some physical correlation there with the size of a person and their skin. Uh, we Not too many negative correlations, but we do have some. They're very light. Uh, but this is, this is helpful to look at uh, when you're just starting and trying to get a sense of uh, what the data looks like and what we got working with for us. And so now that we've done that, 
we can start building some basic models and get a sense of uh, how we're going to do that. We're going to start first with a logistic regression, just because I think that is easy to a uh, understand the output as well as how the the different coefficients interact and create the the, the class output. And then secondly, I think it's easy to look at the feature importance for this. And uh, it's a little bit simpler than looking at something straight away as such as like a random forest. So we're going to start with that and we're going to use sklearn for all of these. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is have an understanding of cross-validation. Um, so what we're going to be doing is k-fold cross-validation in where we're going to be taking uh, splitting our data into five pieces or x amount of pieces and train on x minus one amount of those pieces and test on the other one and run through all the possible combinations of those to ensure that we are not overfitting and uh, or it's a it's a it's a way to prevent, hopefully prevent overfitting it doesn't solve all your problems though and there definitely are more advanced ways to do certain types of cross validation particularly when working with time series data or, or any uh, uh, more advanced types of data so we're just going to keep things simple though and just do some k-fold class validation to ensure that. And so what's going to happen is we're going to train the logistic regression on uh, each fold and combine those results to get a holistic view of how the model performed as well as the feature importance. And we also would note that um, if you're not familiar with logistic regression from a mathematical perspective, I encourage you to read up on it. It gives a lot of good insight to uh, the building blocks of a lot of types of machine learning models and just having an understanding, I think, of uh, what's going on under the hood is really important for when you're analyzing the output and considering how to adjust features um, as well as make conclusions based on the results. Okay, so now we're going to go into the model building. So, we are going to need to import some sklearn packages. So first we're going to want train and test split. And uh, actually, um, for now we're going to just use train test split and not uh, worry too much about the cross validation until we get a little, little bit further here. Because um, this will allow us to at least just quickly take a look at the data results. Okay, we're going to need the import as well. So this is just going to split the data set uh, by a percent that we specify into training and testing sets. And we also need to take off, take out the label and uh, put that as the Y since that's what we want to predict. We don't want that to be part of our feature set. Okay, so now we have that. So let's just take a look at what this is going to do for us. We import that. And so first I want to just specify X to be all of our features. So this is going to be the DF uh, dot drop. Uh, we're going to drop the label column. And this is a column. So now, uh, first we're going to want to specify Y as DF label. So hopefully this will make our data frames as we expect. Okay, so now we have a same number of rows, just no label column, good. And then Y is a series of just the label columns, awesome. That's what we want, because uh, that's what this takes in. And so we will feed in X and Y as well as the test size we want to use. Let's just use 20% in this case, and then a random state. This is just to keep results consistent. Let's choose, I don't know, 13. And let's see how it splits this up. So in the variable explorer, we can see that the train set is 614 rows, while the test set is 154 rows. Uh, as expected, there's a 20 20% of it is reserved for the testing, and it splits the X and the Y uh, equivalently. And so each of the, the Y columns at a certain point correspond to that data point in the X columns, which then you can use to train the model and then evaluate the results on the test set. Uh, so what we're going to do now is actually construct the logistic regression model.
it's nice to always just scroll down to the examples if if you're kind of familiar with the, the ideas behind it, um, and then you can just take it directly from here. Uh, okay, so first let's just grab the import statement. So there's a lot of options in this case too with uh, the type of solver used as well as if it's multi-class. Uh, so in our case we're not uh, multi-class so it shouldn't be an issue um, or we won't have to adjust anything there. Okay, we load that. Oh, CLF just I guess is a short term for classifier which we'll, I guess we'll call it the thing. Uh, so we can keep the random state as that. Um, we're going to just take this out, let it use as default. So you can create these in two separate ones here. So we could just do, we can do it like this. Um, so this first one is just constructing the actual model and its parameters, not training it, just simply uh, putting those parameters in and creating an instance of the logistic regression. And so if we do that, we can get it ready then to be able to fit to the data set we want. So we don't want to fit it to all of the X and the Y's. We want to just fit it to the X train and the Y train. So this should fit the model then using those data points uh, that we specified as the training period. And you saw too that it outputs uh, the model parameters that it is using. And so this may be helpful if we start to play with it a little bit. Uh, you can see right now it's using a L2 penalty. This is something that we can adjust in the future when we look at lasso and ridge regression types as well as elastic net if we want to combine the two. Uh, no class weight, uh, that's something to note because in our case with unbalanced we may want to introduce a class weight uh, where a, the one with less samples has maybe uh, a higher a high reward for the, uh, the model predicting it correctly uh, which then can balance out the situation. We may come across a situation where uh, the model just always chooses the one that had the highest amount of observations which we don't want to happen. And so we'll take that into account too when we're analyzing the results with different types of metrics uh, rather than just basic accuracy because that can be very misleading. Okay, so now that we've fit it on that, uh, we can predict it. And so you can also predict the probabilities. So in, in, our, in our case with two classes, it would give you the, the probability that it would be in each of the classes with they would sum up to one. Uh, this can be useful if you're looking at ROC, AUC type curves um, you can also do a lot of different types of model interpretability work with the probabilities. Uh, but for our purposes, we're just going to look at just the, the CFL predict uh, function, which is just going to give us the actual values. So the same labels. And we want to predict it on the X test. So this will you go to the X test and generate a corresponding uh, Y test uh, results, that which we're going to compare to the true Y test. Oops, we need to save that. So this is our Y predict. Okay, so let's first, I guess, just look at the accuracy of this. Um, so, So this accuracy score metric is just going to uh, take in the y true and the y prediction and just create a pure accuracy, right? So 50% correct uh, versus you know 60% correct and, and so on. Uh, just comparing those two values, so we can similarly import the accuracy score and just like our example, this is going to be very similar to our case, except we only have two classes, which make things pretty easy. Um, but it's a good starting point. Okay, and just to make sure we remember how to do it, we'll just do it like that. Okay, so we got our accuracy score equals the accuracy score. Let's not call it exactly that here. Let's just call it a shorthand so we don't confuse them. So y true 
uh, this would be our y test, and then we have our y prediction. So let's see. So you can see over here, our accuracy is pretty high. So we have a 75% accuracy. And if we want to just take a look at how that's distributed, um, hopefully the our predictions are not all one-sided. No, so they look relatively similar to uh, how the the original um, labels looked. And so I believe that this is being shuffled. Um, we can take a look. So originally they were all like ones and zeros and then back to ones, just to make sure that, yeah, so this they're definitely shuffled, um, which is good. Uh, in time series, this is actually, you don't want to shuffle data uh, because there's high autocorrelation between the values. Uh, shuffling it for k-fold is, is not a correct approach. But in this case, where we don't have to concern about the order in which these observations occurred, this is completely fine and how we want to do it. Okay, um, so from there, so we, we want to also, just to expand upon a little bit of the idea about making sure that it's not just choosing one side, we can just look at the baseline accuracy, which would be the, the accuracy that the model would get if it just chose the, uh, the, the label that had the highest number of observations in, in the training period, or even then in the testing period, it, the training period is a little bit more realistic. Uh, so what we'll do there, we'll just type in the baseline accuracy is the, uh, uh, we'll do the baseline accuracy is, we're going to do this, so we want to sum the observations um, from the one class versus the sum of observations of the other class and choose the one that has the most, right? So we already know that the sum of the zeros, I believe, is the one that we have the most of. Let's just make sure. And we're going to imagine that that's the same for the periods or for the different folds as well. Uh, okay, so we're going to just do the sum. I believe we can do it like this. Uh, let's see. Is that equal? Let's see. Okay, so a couple ways that we can just sum the values here. Um, um, I thought there was a cleaner way to do it. Hmm. Well, we, what we can do is just do the length of the data frame where y dot. Actually, this might just work by itself. I don't know. Don't know. Um, is that the total? Let's check. Okay, so that didn't work. No. Uh, that is because we need to slice it. So if we just go ahead and do this, this is how you'd normally slice it with a pandas data frame. I imagine it'll work the same with the series. Okay, so now that works. Cool. So we're going to want to do y equals 0 over the length of y equals 1. This will give us the baseline accuracy, which should be pretty high. Okay, that is not correct. That's way too high. We need to add the total number of observations. So that's going to be... I guess we can just do the length of y. Okay, that looks better. So our model got a score of 75% and the baseline accuracy is 65%. That's great. Uh, that means the model added value and it wasn't just picking the right side.
Next, we're going to look to improve this and as look at some additional scoring metrics. I'm quickly going to grab some water. I will be right back. All right. Okay. So now, um, so there's a lot of different ways to evaluate the accuracy. Uh, you can look at things like F1 scores, which look take into account like true positives versus false positives type thing, and the confusion matrix, um, which is a popular way, particularly when some classes uh, are more important to get correct. Um, I guess in this case, it is a medical application, so it may be you know worse to uh, not detect diabetes in someone and then to falsely detect diabetes. And so this confusion matrix and the different values you can calculate off that uh, can provide uh, can provide a little bit more value than just the basic accuracy scores. One value that I've uh, started to use quite a bit is Cohen's kappa. And so basically what this score does is kind of similar to comparing it to the baseline score, it compares, kind of gives a representation of how much better it is than if it was just be chosen at random. And so let's calculate it for this case, I guess, and uh, see what we would expect. I'm guessing, so it's definitely going to be above zero, uh, since we know that it is outperforming the baseline score. It's probably going to be, you know, 50, point, point 0.5, maybe. Um, it's just a guess. Let's see. So this is also just an sklearn, so you can just import the value, and then you can just send in y1 and y2. In this case, it doesn't care which one is the predictor and the true. It just is taking them both and determining the, the difference between them. Um, actually, it shouldn't measure. Yes, it just measures the, me the measure of agreement. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, if we just go back here, import that. So let's just do colon score equals. Okay, it's 0.42, pretty close to 0.5. Um, so that's a strong score. I mean, the, the data sets that I'm looking at, like at work and uh, elsewhere, I mean, we, we look for, I mean, just small edges, particularly within in financial markets. I mean, small edge is enough to have a great gain. And in these cases, right, you can just think about all the applications of machine learning where uh, just improving it a little bit or just taking time away uh, that humans don't have to spend making these decisions can drastically improve it. I mean, I don't know how this is currently being done to detect these diabetes issues, uh, but I mean, just just looking at a simple logistic regression because that's a pretty good uh, accuracy. And I mean, we haven't done any fancy cross validation to assume it's not overfitting and whatnot, but uh, it at least is encouraging. And since we are still looking at it in a test period, okay. Um, so now we're going to take a look at feature importance. So this is important to understand which features are driving these results. And so the basic uh, output you can do is just a nice bar plot. Uh, and in the regression case, it's pretty straightforward as uh, you just, they multiply the values by the coefficients and just sum those up to then determine, um, determine the label. So I think there's a nice example on here that we can just copy and paste. I believe it's CL. I think I just do CLF dot coef. That's what I feel like I remember, but I don't think it will have the. Uh, let's see if that will just print out. To make it a, we need to give it the labels and so on. So that's what I'm looking for online. But this should okay. Yeah. So that will at least give us the values there.
Uh, this is probably going to be in Okay, awesome. Wow, all right, so we can see this petty uh, factor is very important. And was that one that we took a note on? Was not. Hmm. So it wasn't incredibly correlated to the label, but it seems to be very important. Or, uh, actually, um, this there, we haven't done any regularization. So these are on different scales. So we actually can't make any statements about which one is necessarily uh, more important than any other. So that will be the next thing we do. Um, that's always important, is standardizing values so that when there are regularization and we get to last in regression where it's penalizing uh, coefficients being too large, then it will penalize all of the features equivalently. If they're all on different scales, like in this case, this may actually be uh, a very small movement in the relation to the overall size of this. So I would, I'm going to imagine right now that these values are very large. Let's take a look. Uh, we're going to look in X. Interesting. The alternative is true. They're very small. Oh, okay, that makes sense, right? Because uh, they have to have to, to capture changes in that variable that the coefficient needs to be very large uh, for it to have a similar effect like to the other features. Okay, that makes sense. And now then, <clears throat> we are going to standardize based on, uh, so standardizing meaning that we're going to fit the data to a normal curve centered at zero and with standard deviation of one. And so everything's gonna be on the same scale. And where we're gonna do that is we're gonna use the distribution parameters from the training to standardize the training as well as the testing. So there's no uh, look ahead bias or leaking of information from the, the training set to the testing set. Uh, if, if you do just take the overall and then create the distribution to then scale the values to zero uh, to zero mean and unit variance, then uh, there's going to be information that was leaking over and that can have in, in, that can have an impact on your accuracy. It will actually improve it uh, because it will have knowledge that wasn't accessible in, in the training set. And that's always important when you're doing any of this is you want to make sure that there's no data that is getting included and in where it shouldn't be getting included and you're trying to ensure that uh, it's at least as professionally done and um, lacking of bias as possible. Okay, so the way we're going to do that is a scalar and has a function. I think I'm actually going to just take it from this as well because I think that's right there. Uh, so this was a project I did last semester that was actually looking at predicting taxi travel times uh, between various parts in New York City. And so you got exposure to a lot of different types of models, buildings, feature engineering, um, pulling data from Google, BigQuery, all sorts of things. So it was a fun project. And it was a good opportunity to use the skills we learned during the course. Um, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to use regularization. So we're going to put this back up here What before we fit the data. So this is going to be actually right when we start. So we have the scalar. So this is going to be what uh, oh, we need to import. Oops, don't want to open Spotify right now. Um, Pre-processing. Okay. Okay, so what this is going to do is create a scaling information based on the training data, and then it's going to transform the training data and the testing data according to that transformation. So we're actually going to need to put this after the split. So you can put that right there before we do anything with the model. Oops. 
Okay, and so that should just, let's take a look at it. So now if we do a df describe, they should all be normally distributed. Whoops, did not mean to do that. Uh, X train is actually a matrix, so let's just let's just take a look at it, I guess. Okay, uh, so you can see all the values are relatively bounded uh, between you know negative four and four, a couple of higher outliers possibly, but everything looks to be standardized based on the column. Hopefully it did it by the column. Yeah, it should have, right? That's, that is suspicious though if it did not. Um, let's just make sure. If it didn't, then we'd expect those super large values to just pop out. Um, so I'm guessing for sure it did, right? Because these all look relatively similar. But let's just make sure. refers to features, which I assume mean the columns, but we want to make sure that it's not doing the entire data set. It does refer to the columns. Let's just make sure. Okay, we'll normalize the features each column of x individually. That's what we want. Cool. Yep, all columns are scaled separately. Good to always check. I mean, these pieces where you can easily add in uh, unknown error. Okay, um, so now we're good to go. So let's run this again. And so we previously saw that, what was it? The, uh, the petty had a very high coefficient. So we're going to expect that to actually decrease in this case. Um, let's just rerun this whole portion here. And we'll also take a look at the accuracy as well. Okay, now this is much more reasonable. Uh, so we see that the accuracies all are the same. Wouldn't expect them to be identical, but I hmm. guess that makes sense. Maybe. It's kind of suspicious. <laughs> we'll come back to that, though. Um, And yeah, so that makes a lot more sense, right? So the two that we did think were going to be the most important, plaz and mass, now do have the highest coefficients. So that's a good thing to see. Um, it means that the model is using those features that are highly correlated to the output variable. And then there are some that also influence the uh, alternative direction. Um, so these are ones that uh, have, still have an impact. Uh, but uh, I guess this would be for not having diabetes, possibly, uh, in the other direction. Okay, uh, so the feature importance agrees with that, which is good to see. Now, next, we 
first let's take a look at this accuracy thing. Um, so if I change the random state of this. Okay, that's suspicious. First off, we wanted to do the baseline accuracy. Actually, that's relatively equivalent. Uh, let's assume equal proportions. Hmm. So the accuracy is always the same. Let's just make sure, though, that it does change, right? Because that wouldn't make sense if it doesn't change. Okay, that is not changing. So there might be a problem here. Unless it's just not getting updated on the variable explorer. I've had issues with the variable explorer before. Hmm. So what if we, I mean, just do an extreme case where the test size is 0 0.9. So it, this should have a very poor accuracy. Okay, well, it does change. That's odd, though, that it's still able to do quite well. Let's make it a really... This is always good, too, when you're developing these types of models to just play with it and ensure things you know, work as expected and in both directions. You know, purposely make things worse, and then hopefully purposely make things better as well. Okay. So I guess it's fine. Um, I, I guess the data set isn't too difficult, uh, which is why the, the the results are so similar. Uh, so now what we're gonna do is we can either try to introduce some regularization penalty via lasso ridge elastic into the logistic regression, or we can move on to like a random forest or try to improve it just by changing the model type. Um, based on this plot, okay that's quite different now too as well, but that's okay. Oh, that was in the case where we had such a small one. Alright, let's run this. Okay, that's good. Um, so in that case, yeah, let's see if we can apply some lasso ridge principles here. So what we're going to expect is in oh, I closed it. Okay, so the big difference is between ridge and lasso is the penalty. And so in this case, this is your standard uh, linear regression model, and we're going to add an L2 penalty, right? So this is the square uh, of, of the coefficients, the betas. As well, lasso is adding a penalty that's not the square. So what happens is when you have a really small value, a square of that is even in smaller value. And so ridge regression then won't uh, set many of the values to zero uh, because it can have very small values and it'll be fine. As L1, um, as, as L1, it will force them to be exactly zero. And this goes back to how the which is because the constraint region is a square like this, that the points at which uh, this square hit this contour is highly likely to be on one of these axes, which put, set the values to either a value or zero. So in this case, B2 gets a value while B1 is set to zero. And in the ridge regression case, which is the L2, this, this region, the penalty term region, is a circle. 
and there it's equally likely to hit all places on the circle, resulting in situations where both, in this case, b2 and b1 are given uh, coefficients. And so this is how it relates uh, visually to the contour space and the penalties. And uh, we'll see that happen when we apply them to our case. So we'd expect in the lasso case uh, that the many, maybe possibly some of these values, will be set to zero. Uh, while in the ridge case, it may keep all of the, the features, and they will just be very small. So let's give that a shot. Um, we're going to go ahead and open up back the So I think right now it's doing L2 by default. When we, when we printed out the... Uh, so solvers only support L2 penalties. Okay. Um, so C is the regularization string. Okay. So if right now, first let's add in, uh, specify the penalty to make sure that it does what we're expected, and then play with the, the regularization just to give it a sense of what's happening. So we're going to add in the penalty. In this case, let's start with just L2. So this is the one where we expect the coefficients to just to not be completely wiped to zero, uh, but to remain to remain small. And we're going to set C. So this is inverse to the regularization string. It must be a positive flow. Uh, so a small value less than negative one, less than one, uh, is going to increase the regularization. So let's just do. Um, so let's start with no regularization, right? So let's just put over that random 20, see what happens. Okay, so as we expected, that's what we already had. And so there was no real regularization that influenced the size of these features. Now though, let's put this at 0 0.1. So we'd expect the size of these to decrease. I think that may have. Um, we can take it to a little bit more of an extreme, though, just to see here. OK, yeah, now you can see the scales. So this was previously up to 1. I mean, these were down to negative, or negative 0 0.2. Uh, so this is also hurting the, possibly hurting the accuracy as we do that. Um, so there is a, a fine line between doing that. Uh, but so now that we've seen the, the L2 does that, but it's still, still see how it keeps the skin f variable uh, included in the feature set, even though it's an extremely small value. Uh, so now if we change it to L1, uh, let's go back to the case of where we have no penalty, or no real penalty. Oh, so we have to change the solver type. Um, um, so which one can use L1? Alright, here we go. So, handle L2 or no penalty. Let's try this Libby linear. Or what? I don't even know what these are. What's Saga? For small data sets, Libby standard is good to Okay, let's do the Lib linear. Okay, so now we have L1. Hopefully, no penalization. Cool. I expected they remain basically the same, but now once we crank this up, we're going to expect some of them to actually go to zero. Oh, I don't know if I closed that. Ah, so in this case, all of them are set to zero except one. All right, so that's too extreme, uh, possibly, of regularization. So if we just try to find maybe a correct blend, so this is, can be useful um, in discarding features that aren't important here. So the ones that we saw previously that were just small values, skin and insu, now are completely not used uh, by the logistic regression model. And so this can help filter down larger feature spaces uh, just in a very simple way. And, uh, and it's, it's useful also to just see the impact of regularization. And then you can also combine them using elastic net, which is a blend of L1 and L2. For our purposes, let's go ahead and just uh, 
we'll just use we'll leave the religious aggression as is for that. And so next, though, we're going to move into a nonlinear uh, model, uh, which is a random forest. So random forests are great. Uh, it's basically just an ensemble of decision trees, um, which are generated and trained using your feature space and a bunch of different parameters. And then they all, all vote on a, the class that it thinks it is. And that class that gets the most votes then from the ensemble of decision trees is the overall decision made by the random forest. And so these are incredibly easy to use as you don't have to really worry about regularization like we did in this case. So the regularization comes up in different ways and it doesn't really, the, the scale of the values don't matter. Uh, the distribution doesn't really matter. It's just a lot easier to run. So, I mean, out of the box, you can run a random forest without having a, having a clear understanding of what's going on uh, under the hood. As in when we're working with this regression type case, I mean, we didn't even look at, for example, I mean, if it if the data even meets the requirements of a regression, that it's, these data is normally distributed, it's, uh, if it's heteroscedastic, uh, and any of these things that we didn't even really did explore. So it's a lot uh, easier to just use a random forest in this case. And particularly if you don't aren't, aren't looking for the outputs uh, to actually, you know, make a difference, or you or unless you're using it for like feature importance work, it's it's also a good starting point too to verify that uh, there are nonlinear relationships because maybe in a case that they're all just all perfectly linear relationships, you don't need uh, if they're all perfectly linear relationships, then you don't need a nonlinear method. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's just easy to use random forest. So we're gonna do something very similar. So we're gonna Keep that. Um, and okay, so we're not going to include this. We do not need this in the random forest model. But this is all going to be the same, except the feature importance may be slightly different. So this is going to be a random forest classifier. So that you can use a random forest both for classification and regression, uh, similar to logistic and linear regression. We're going to import that. And first, we're just going to train the model with the default parameters, uh, but we are going to go into hyperparameter tuning them. OK, uh, we don't need to include any of this. So let's see if we can just run it straight out of the box. Awesome. Uh, so the accuracy scores are pretty comparable, uh, which is, is good. Um, no huge improvements, but we're going to see if we can improve it, particularly just through hyperparameter tuning in this case. I mean, you could also do feature engineering uh, to, make, to make the feature stronger, to create new features, but we're going to keep things simple. And so to look at the feature importance, So things you can do are, uh, you can look at individual trees to see which features are important. And then combine those together to get the overall feature importance, which I believe is what this will do. And we can similarly plot it as well. I think this does a table though. Okay, no, it so this should do the same thing. Awesome. So now we can see the feature importance. It's not saying uh, which direction uh, these features influence the model, uh, but you can see though that we didn't have the same 
scale effect as we did when we ran the naive logistic regression where the petty variable was had a huge large value. In this case, we go back and see that the plas and the mass uh, values, as expected, were the leaders on this. But we see that all values are relatively helpful. So that's encouraging to see. I will be right back, and then we'll get into the hyperparameter tuning. All right, we're back. Hopefully, still recording. Awesome. Looks like things are going well. Okay, so now we're gonna cover hyperparameter tuning real quick. Um, but first. We're going to actually do a little bit of cross validating. Uh, so, a couple of things we can, a couple of ways we can go about doing this. We're going to just do standard k fold cross validation. So what this is going to do is it's going to split up, uh, similar to the test train split, uh, our x and y data sets into different folds. Um, we do want it, we're okay with actually shuffling in this case, since there is no autocorrelation. Um, but let's get an example. Okay, so we're going to just create a for loop similar to what they do and use that. And so now we have the train index and test indices uh, of the splits that we can use. We're going to do five, four splits. Uh, we're going to have shuffle equals true. And just for simplicity, each time we're only going to look at the just accuracy. Oops. Okay, so now we're going to want to include these in the for loop, right? So each time it's going to generate these x train, x tests, y train, y tests from the uh, x and y values. So uh, how we're going to do that is we can just move all of this hack. We don't even need this no more. We don't need any of that. Uh, we're going to put that in there. So now we just need to specify the, the X train. So as they did, we can just do the exact same. Since we have defined X and Y, this is likely is exact exactly as we need. Okay. So now, same thing. We're gonna have it for each of the ones, and then we're gonna just make a, an array outside of this that is gonna keep track of the the fold performance. So this is gonna be 
the accuracy value that the model attains on each of the defaults. So, and each time we're just going to append this score to the fold path. And we can just plot the fold path at the end if we want. Fold, fold perf actually for performance. And so we need to import, but then we should be good to go. So we have some issues with the indexes. Um, so we can take a look at how they have theirs. Okay. Um, probably need an iLock. So iLock and lock are used for index location slicing. I imagine this should fix the problem. Not sure though. Okay, cool. And so we can see that we ran it on four folds. So we have one, two, three, four data points. And the accuracy results do vary. And so this is, goes back to the idea of minimizing overfitting. And I mean, if you just work on one particular set of data, and one training and testing set, uh, and you make all your adjustments to improve that testing set, then it's gonna fail on a new testing set, right? Or when it goes into the production and there's new live data coming into it, it won't be able to maintain the same results that you saw during the training and testing period. And that's why we do this. So an, a logical approach would be something like take the mean of this performance to represent how it did across all those folds. Uh, and which is a great way to evaluate it. And I mean, this also didn't even take into account the baseline approach that we took. So maybe something better to do would look at the Cohen score um, for this case, which gives it a little bit of a little bit more insight. Or you could look at the improvement over the baseline. Uh, this I'll, I'll leave this for an, another time, but you could go into a lot more details and explore different ways to look at the accuracy of these models, uh, particularly when you are doing these cross-validation methods. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea of why it's important and uh, something that you should always be taking into account when developing any type of model. Uh, I mean, look at the last score. Like, you got above uh, 0.8, which is quite good, but the first model got below 0.7. So uh, definitely need to take that into account. And so now what we're going to look at is we didn't pass in any parameters to the random forest. So let's see if we can actually improve that. So I guess let's, let's might as well actually uh, start looking at the mean of this. So we can get a sense of that when we're hyperparameter tuning. Uh, we are going to use some some functions to help us along the way. But um, just to start, let's just do Alright, so our mean performance was 0.74. Awesome. Okay, uh, so the ways in which you want to hyperparameter tune. There's been some, I've used some great articles to just guide hyperparameter tuning. There's a, a lot of things you can explore in this area, and uh, to keep things simple, it's best to start with a smaller hyperparameter space with maybe a handful of uh, parameters that you understand, and tune those and then if there's anything else, I mean, you could leave it up to grid search. There's random search. There's also a new like Bayesian type optimi optimization methods, uh, which iteratively go through the parameters, tune them, and uh, move on to other parameters and so on. But to keep things simple, we're going to probably do a basic grid search for a couple parameters that, that we understand. And so there is a good article, I think. It lays the ground for a couple that are worth exploring, right? Because, I mean, there are so many uh, different parameters for this random forest that you could spend days, I mean, trying to go through all of these. Um, 
I guess there's not that many compared. XG Boost has quite a few more. So there really aren't that many, but still, uh, all the different options that you can put in here um, make it quite complicated. So we want to ensure that we, uh, when we're doing our hyperparameter tuning, we are cross-validating, right? Because similar idea, if we make our feature engineering uh, improvements or uh, the model building improvements on just a single test set, then we're going to overfit it and it's not going to work as expected. So what we want to do, so these are an example of the parameters that are currently being used by a model, and we, we want a couple of them to adjust. So, uh, and estimators, this is just the number of trees in the forest, and so the greater the number of trees always will improve performance, but uh, the runtime will drastically increase as well. So that's something that you want to scale around. So maybe 100 is fine for when you're working with a small data set. Uh, you can scale that up quite a bit. Uh, you can just play with it. Max features. So this is the number of features considered for splitting in uh, the percent, right? So common ones include the square root. Uh, you could do 20%, 80%, and this is another thing to prevent overfitting. So you don't want all of your trees looking at all of the same data. And so in this case, it will only look at a subset of those features at each tree. So each tree kind of gives a different, uh, a different view on the decision uh, opposed to the other trees. And together, they can come to a really thorough conclusion. So that's something important to look at. Uh, max depth, this also has to do with um, overfitting. So if you let the tree just grow arbitrarily large, uh, it will almost try to, to fit every possible instance that was in the training set, for example, and can get down to decisions that are based on uh, in, uh, arbitrary data points. And we don't, we don't want that, particularly because when we give it a new testing set, uh, it needs to be prepared to make more heuristic decisions uh, about that. So we want to try to limit the max depth um, as much as possible. And then you have things like the minimum samples required for the split as the leaf. Um, this is to give a sense on how frequently it should split and how much it should leave on a leaf node. And so what we're going to do, I think, is... Yeah, we're just going to fit, I guess, max features and max steps. Let's, let's do that for now. Uh, so what we want to do is you want to create a dictionary of the grid that you want. So in our case, we're going to do hyperparam grid, and we're going to just do these. OK, and so for estimators, we'll just show that the higher, the more there are, the better. So let's just do 310. Let's do a all right, that should be good. Max features. So we're going to do this in terms of percents. Let's say, I'm trying to do some extremes so you can see how it works. Max depth. Um, well, this is really dependent on. Hmm, okay, so there is. Don't, it, this is really going to depend on the data set you're working with, but we'll go ahead and just use that as well. Awesome. And then, thankfully, SKLearn provides you with grid search CV, which will go through. all these combinations and while doing cross-validation and report the results. So this is very helpful not to have to code. Sometimes if you do, uh, you may have to make adjustments if you do any fancy cross-validation methods or uh, you, want, you, know, you want to be aware of certain things at different steps, then you're going to have to do a little bit of a editing here. Um, but out of the box, it's pretty solid. So let's look at an example. Boom, all you have to do, grid search CV parameters, uh, the model, and it, it goes. So I think also it's really easy to um, I think it's pretty easy to uh, also just put in your own splitter, which we'll do because we want to make sure that shuffle equals true. Okay, so in this case 
we can set it on our whole data set uh, because it's going to split it on for uh, during the grid search for us. So we don't have to worry about that. Uh, this should just be a random forest classifier instance, and then we need to import the grid search CV. Um, so let's just check though if we if we can just send in the splitter that'd be nice. Pretty sure we can here. Okay, yeah, we can just throw in the CV splitter. So we're gonna we already created one that we we want to use here with shuffle equals true just to make sure, and the number of splits. We're just gonna set that equal KF here, and that should work. And so what we want to get out of this is the best performance as well as what parameters gave that best performance. And so, oh, we also need to consider what, how it's going to evaluate that scoring. And so what do we want it to score by? Uh, so you can, I, I believe there's a bunch of different ones that you can choose as a metric from just a list if we just want to use the general ones. So yeah, you can make scores which we're going to do. And we're going to make a score from, let's just do the, the Cohen's Kappa. So, grid score. And you could make this however you wanted. I mean, you can get fancier as well. We're gonna just make score. Uh, what's it called? Cohen Kappa score. So then we can put in scoring equals grid score. All right. So now we should be at least happy with what we got going on. Okay, so what what is the output? The results, right? So after this is fit, it's gonna have a data frame <clears throat> of the different results given it. It's gonna have our best score and then best params. I mean, so those are what we're really gonna be interested in, right? And it's the mean cross-validated score. So similar to how we were looking at that plot, uh, we took the mean of that to evaluate it. Uh, that's what this is going to do each time. So if we give this a run, it should work. Uh, when you're working with larger data sets, this can become computationally intense very quickly. And so these grid search methods can become really, really slow, uh, particularly when you're doing gradient boosting algorithms like the XGBoost. Uh, uh, you might have to find alternative ways to strategically choose how you want to explore the hyperparameter space. And to start with that, a method that I found good success with this summer is having like a very basic uh, A, understanding of the data and the features to generate a correct feature set, and B, of what type of model you're working with and what you expect that data to come in as. And from there, you can kind of just give a basic guideline, a uh, basic hyperparameter space that should work well. And then if you do have to adjust that hyperparameter space, uh, you can look at the results and then uh, make adjustments there to, to better meet the model. But if you have an understanding of the data as well as the model, uh, you should be able to guide it relatively well. All right, so this is taking a second. Um, but afterwards, what we're going to want to look at is best param. All right, so you can see here too, they already pop up. So we want to look at the best score and the best param. And we would hope that that best score is going to be higher than this one. I imagine, I don't know if this is for the, the random force, I think it's from the logistic regression still there, but we'd hope that that score gets above that. 
uh, meaning that the hyperplane retaining is adding value. And just to kind of look, go over what we've done so far, some important takeaways, I think, are when we first looked at the, the, feature, the features, and so their distribution as well as their correlation, we got a little bit of insight on what we expected to be features that drove the performance. And, uh, and so we saw that PLAS and MADS had high correlation to label, and we expected that to then in, for the model to find something similar. And uh, first, we didn't see that, right, with the logistic regression because we didn't properly standardize the, the data. And I mean, that's just a good idea in general is to sanity check those results, right? When we saw that, uh, we were kind of confused that, that these, these, uh, these features weren't the highest uh, of importance. And so that led us then to be, oh, we need to regularize it. And once we regularized it, then they did show up to be the best. And so that's important as well. And I think the we mentioned originally that the skin possibly had a data quality issue. If I remember correctly, that was one that actually uh, got set to zero when we increased the, the penalty. We'll take a look at it in a second when that's after done. But if so, that's also a great find. And we're also skimming over a lot of things here as well um, because I guess we can go back maybe and add the, the, the balanced class or sorry, not the balance class, but to just add a uh, add a class weights so that the model has a better job of picking up the minority class, but they're not really that skewed in this case, so it's not too important. Uh, after this, we're going to do one thing in model interpretability, a uh, cool package that gives a good, good insight into feature importance as well as which features are really contributing to the, the outcomes. And it has a nice... Uh, a nice visual component here. So these are called the Shapley values. And so it can work for any model. So these as well as Lime. Lime package is also cool because it will actually give you insight into how individual decisions are made. And so it does a perturbation analysis. Uh, we actually pull it up a little bit. while oh, this is loading. Yeah, so in these cases, it kind of gives, it uses the, the probabilities and, uh, not a good example, uh, but it creates these, these plots which show uh, which features and their values at that for that particular data point had a large influence on the results. Here you go. Uh, so you can see you have these prediction probabilities, and so I think it's, atheism and the reason that is true is because of these values right and uh, it works better on or I've only used it for tabular data where it will actually be more numerical and so you can see you know yeah right here so this will show exactly uh, the, because that value is below that this particular decision was made and um, it does that by perturbing these features and looking at the results of the model with those changes and seeing how sensitive it is to that, and in these cases where uh, it can get it can give insight into which features are really important and help explain a lot of model interpretability and how the model is functioning. Um, particularly in finance world, there's a lot of more traditional type investors which are want to know why certain trades are generated and the really have a sense of what the model is doing. And so you can also make statements then about the broader market as well as apply these findings elsewhere. And so it's important to be able to at least have a little bit of understanding into what the model is doing. And so Lime has, has been a cool way to do that. Uh, as well as <clears throat> as well as the Shapley values. So the Shapley values are kind of similar. Also, this book is really has a lot of really good value. Uh, some good analysis here. So this is interpretable machine learning. And so it basically has a bunch of examples of ways you can better interpret models as well as explain its outcomes. 
Um, so the Shopify value section is great. And there's a good little antidote here to explain it. Yeah, so you can think of the Shopify value as uh, a feature values enter a room in random order. All the feature values in the room participate in a game, which is contributing to the overall prediction. And then the Shapley value of a feature value is the average change in the prediction that the coalition already in the room receives when the feature value joins them. Uh, so it's really looking in the, in the future importance gates, it may find that uh, there's a really high performing feature, but behind that, there may be one that's assisting another significantly or, assi uh, or assisting a lot of different features to improve the overall outcome. But it may not have a very high value on just the traditional feature importance plot, uh, which is why the Shapley value uh, be, comes in handy. It also creates really pretty visuals, which we'll hopefully get to see in a second if this runs. This grid might be a little too large. Um, I might just stop it and make it smaller. Yeah, we're going to do that. That was probably a silly idea here. So we're just going to do... We're just going to make it a little bit easier here. Um, okay, so we're going to just do kind of extremes. So this may not actually beat the original performance, but it should finish in a reasonable amount of time. Yeah, I probably should have known better not to do so many. Uh, yeah, let's go ahead. We can open the tutorial. Oh, that's the lime tutorial. So this is the chat package. Yeah, so this is really cool. So this is an individual data point. And it's saying the the features that caused it to have a higher or lower value. Um, you can also this is interactive, so you can drop this down. You can look at the influence on features to other features as well as to the output variable, and get a really good sense for how the feature works in the space. So this is your standard uh, value. So on here you have the the value of the feature to the model, and then uh, the impact on the model output. And so you get a sense of directional ways. Yeah, I'm not sure if we'll get to go into this too much, but uh, it's really good for any any tree-based models, particularly in gradient boosting, where it's difficult to uh, to portray nice feature importance plots or um, anything like that. I've wanted to. I just started looking into a little bit more light GBM. Uh, as well as CatBoost. CatBoost looks really interesting for categorical, uh, a lot of categorical features. It runs really quickly. I mean, my experience with XGBoost this summer is that it's just been incredibly slow and uh, cumbersome as far as actually being able to hyperparameter tune. So I think that these lighter uh, gradient boosting algorithms definitely are going to be the way forward. Okay, well, hopefully this will t continue, finish shortly. I'm surprised it's taking so long. The data set's not that large. Hopefully I entered things correctly. The 
And so really, too, once you do hyperparameter tuning and get to that stage uh, and you start to really try to squeeze out any additional accuracy that you can get, um, it really becomes helpful if you do have some knowledge of the features and ways to combine them and that the, mo that the model can't do on its own. Uh, to, to ha having that insight can definitely improve it, right? We're skipping basically all maybe possibly low-hanging fruit at the feature engineering side and trying to just do it you know, with pure model building, uh, which is not the is definitely not going to result in the best performing model when you do this in practice. Uh, really take into consideration what you're predicting as well as the feature space and the features you have can guide your decision making process in a better way than just trying to hyperparameter tune it. Like you can only expect slight improvements uh, via hyperparameter tuning, um, but at the end it, it really does matter. But uh, you can expect big improvements if you can maybe even find new features to add to the model or just adjust the features that are currently being used in the model. And so we'll probably finish off after we just this hyperparameter tune um, with kind of a overview of what we've done and I mean possible directions that you could go in the future. So I guess for example to oh that looks like a typo. I hope that might be causing an issue. Hopefully, man, if that was really what was causing the holdup, that is going to be annoying. Well, I guess either way, we restarted it, so <laughs> hopefully it's uh, doesn't take too long here. It's nice to you and do it this way. You can throw in a, just a print function so you know where you're at in the process. But, oh, hold on. Uh, it should be okay. I didn't specify that that is the param grid, but that should work. Randomized search is also good if you want to increase the 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 search base. Um, you can set just a number of uh, number of combinations that we'll try, which can be a quick way to at least get a little bit of direction into which uh, hyperparameters may be important. This data set also seems to be. Uh, a fairly good data set to, to practice on, and particularly for beginners. Uh, I mean, it seemed pretty easy to get such a high accuracy, which uh, isn't always the case in a lot of data sets, and uh, seems pretty easy to work with, with the data all being numerical. With categorical variables, um, you have to do things like uh, dummy variables, one-hot encoding, um, which transform it transform it into multiple columns with uh, zero, zero, ones. And so uh, this is a little bit easier to work with now that it, we're just working with numerical values. But that is something that you do have to consider, particularly when, uh, when building the models, uh, the linear models. Because linear models can't take in just a, a category, right? <clears throat> they have to have a numerical value associated with them, so you just have to do it that way. Dang, this is quite slow. I hope it's working correctly. Hmm. <laughs>
In the meantime, um, a couple other resources that I found I found helpful when when working with just machine learning or just improving data science skills. Uh, the cross-validated Stack Overflow. I started just looking at the hot topics on it each week, which give a look, give a good overview of I mean statistics and uh, other data science type um, questions that are being talked about, and the answers can sometimes be pretty helpful. So I think going over this, like here's one that's relevant to what we were just working on. Oh, it's, it's almost like exactly what we encountered, right? So the the coefficients didn't necessarily give us the future importance, uh, but when we scaled them to the same range, then they could be helpful. So great example of, I mean, those little details really do matter when you're doing this type of analysis. Oh, great. It finished, but we don't got the best score. So we probably typed something in wrong there. Mm, or there's just, ah, yay. It's just an underscore at the end. So we should be in business. Looks like best params, God. Awesome. So we got a score that is better than our previous Cohen's score. And this was just doing hyperparameter training. Yeah, this is that this is also probably from the logistic regression, but the random forest improved it. Uh, you can see how it chose the estimators. Interestingly, it didn't choose a thousand, which is kind of odd. You would expect it to, but then again we just ran a very small set. Max features, it liked to look at half of the features in each tree, and the depth if the tree is 10 to prevent overfitting. In this case, too, I, I don't think since the, the number of feature space is so small, as well as the number of samples, uh, the, the depth of the trees really isn't going to be too large. And so this is the general process that I think is a good way to go about uh, taking a data set and analyzing it from start to finish. I hope that this has been helpful. Um, another resource, too, that I like to look at and also participate in is blogging. So if you're interested, I do have a blog where I explore generally uh, financial topics, um, but also general data science questions as well. And I thought this would be a good idea to, to do something like this, where I just show something and do something live, uh, just start to finish. And uh, we didn't run into too many obstacles. We did, we did have uh, a couple of situations where we found some bugs, but we were able to get through them, right? So just to give an overview of what we did. So we started with a data set that we didn't have any knowledge about, right? We just took something from random and got into the right format so we could upload it as a CSV. Once we did that, we adjusted the label, took a look at the, the, the distributions of them, as well as took like, some histograms to get a sense of how the data looks. We then looked at the correlations, uh, noted which correlations were high to the output variable, as well as possibly correlations between the features themselves. And then we began model building. We started with a linear model, a logistic regression. And so there we separated our data to an X and Y set. And then we did a train test split. Uh, at first, we didn't standardize our data, in which case we saw that the very small, uh, the, the, features that, the feature that had a very small value um, had a huge relative, a uh, huge importance, it appeared. Uh, but that was actually just because of how small it was. So then once we scaled the data properly, we found that that wasn't the case, and the ones that were most correlated that we saw originally were actually the most important into the logistic regression as well, which was encouraging to see. That was a great takeaway from this, I think. Um, and it is always to be careful, particularly within these regressions, because there's a lot of details that can be overlooked, and we didn't even go through the whole process to properly do a regression. Uh, from there, we did we took a look at regularization. So we saw how in the lasso and ridge cases, with that nice plot um, with the different constraint regions and how it penalizes the terms, how it affects the coefficients differently uh, while leaving them either very small or taking them all the way to zero in the L1 case. Um, so that was an important takeaway as well uh, to see that ability. So that can be used for 
filtering down the features, pro the feature space, or just give you a sense of you know playing with the regularization term and hopefully improving performance, right? Because the idea there would be that uh, it lowers the chances of overfitting if some of the values are set to zero because it's more a heuristic approach to it. We looked at some of the accuracy scores options. So we looked at just based on a basic accuracy score, which really doesn't give much insight since you don't know how the classes are balanced. Uh, so in this case, we did something very basic and just looked at the baseline accuracy, which is the case that if you just chose uh, the one side, how well would it do? And then we looked at Cohen's Kappa score, which gives an ex uh, gives a test to see how comparable they are uh, versus also a random uh, prediction. And we used some bar plots to check out the feature importance and how that influenced it uh, for, for the logistic regression. Then we went into the nonlinear model of a random forest. We did it uh, standard as first uh, with no, with just default parameters. Then we introduced cross-validation. It showed why it's important that we look at the mean uh, or some, some uh, derivative of uh, its performance across all the folds. And uh, from there, then we took a look at hyperparameter chaining, what you can do with, you can also do this with, we could have done this with a logistic regression as well, for example, for the C term to find the best regularization. Uh, we could do that as well. And so from there, we defined a hyperparameter grid with a set of a couple parameters that we thought that we could tune. We used some extreme examples just to ensure that uh, it could highlight some of what, what these things actually mean, right? You would never really expect max features to be set to 0 0.05 unless your feature space was just ridiculously large. Um, or a lot of them were just useless. And then uh, we ran the grid search CV, ensuring that the cross-validation happened each time, and just made our custom score use the Cohen Kappa score. And at the end of the day, uh, we get a better score than what we were working with prior, and we can see what parameters there were. So from here, then the next steps, you know, you could uh, guide the model development even further, <clears throat> because now we know have a sense of uh, what what parameters I found important, so you could add more into this case. But like I mentioned, uh, really the the value could be added on the feature engineering page. So like we really didn't do anything fancy there. Um, we didn't transform variables, uh, particularly when we're working with the the random forest. There's a lot more flexibility since we don't need to regularize uh, the the variables. We can transform them in a variety of different ways. There were also some data quality issues that we didn't really go back and look at. Uh, it's def definitely something to keep important. You could Windsorize the data to eliminate the influence of outliers. Um, also, we could have added the the class weights. So that's something really easy to do. Um, you can just set that as an input into the random forest model. I believe the random forest model as well. Uh, yep, yeah, so you can just do that. Oh, I remember, you can also just, it will automatically do balance for you, which will just set the ratios accordingly. And so that's just as simple as plugging it in, and I bet in this case we didn't even have that. So uh, those are just low-hanging fruit that you can definitely do to improve the model. But I hope this gave just a you know quick look at how from start to finish you can just take a data set and just explore it. I mean, uh, it's fun to look at different data sets even if you're not too familiar with the domain and see what you can make of it. Um, if you enjoyed this video, uh, please definitely let me know. I possibly will make more of these in the future and maybe do cover some more advanced topics. Uh, this is kind of just a trial to see if, if it's something that people would like to see. Um, I do think that there should be more of this online. I encourage people to, you know, show the whole process uh, as opposed to just trying to highlight just the bits, highest bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, uh, I hope you enjoy it and uh, let me know if you have any feedback uh, and uh, I'll catch you next time. Thank you for watching and have a good day.